Hello and welcome to a special tribute episode of iBuzz. In today's episode, we will pay a tribute to Helena Bonham Carter. Known for her work in independent films and large-scale blockbusters, she's, she's the recipient of various accolades, including a British Academy Film Award and three Screen Actress Guild Awards, in addition to nominations for two Academy Awards, nine Golden Globe Awards, four British Academy, Te British Academy Television Awards and five Primetime Emmy Awards. To pay the tribute, we have a film and entertainment journalist Alice Oliver with us. Alice, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. So Alice, uh, throw any dark role at Helena and she will nail, nail it. How would you comment on her acting skills? Oh gosh, just such, such an exquisite range, I think. Like you can never guess what sort of film she's going to be in next. Playing things from, you know, like the Queen Mother to then yeah. someone like Marla Singer in Fight Club. She's just got this extraordinary range and I feel like she always brings a touch of this like gothic elegance to anything she does. Obviously in terms of her style, you know, mm. she's always had this very sort of dark hair. She loves these kind of darker colors. She yeah. always just sort of looks very sort of retro goth chic, I've always thought. Mm. Um, and that just always really adds a lot to her character, I think, into the depth of, of the character she's playing. Um, even she'll pop up um, in, in a sci-fi film, you know, she was in Terminator Salvation. as quite a small role, but it was just such a surprise to see her there as well. She just seems completely unafraid to say yes yeah. to anything. It doesn't seem to matter what genre it is, mm -hmm. who she might be working with. Like you said at the beginning there, it can be from independent films to these huge, you know, financial mm -hmm. kind of smashes in the box office as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think she's just such a joy to watch as well. Yeah. She brings something, I think, quite unique to the role. You can tell that she's always working incredibly hard. She uses her face and her eyes in quite an extraordinary way. I feel like when she sort of stares, when she mm -hmm. stares at you or when she's sort of staring at her, her counterparts in her role, yeah. she really kind of sees them and she's just sort of so intense in, in everything she does mm -hmm. and she just never goes into anything half-heartedly, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Right, and Alice, for the longest, she had worked with Tim Burton. Uh, I would like to ask you, I mean, did you at any level feel the monotony in her characters offered by Tim Burton or it was the other way around? Uh, if Helena was, you know, she was, she succeeded in managing the difference in every role that she was offered. I, I do think she was able to bring a difference to every role and that can be quite difficult because a, a lot of Tim Burton's films are very similar you know they, yeah. they tend to explore sort of quite similar themes they have quite similar looks he himself has a very distinct yes. style you know you could you could watch a film and within a few moments mm. you would know oh this is a tim burton film um but i do think that she was still able to bring something quite unique and and sort of quite diverse to each of her roles sort of playing you know the more the more kind of intensely wacky mm. roles such as in them um, in alice in wonderland for instance and then a, a slightly more understated in some Something like Sweeney Todd um, and then obviously you know bringing a musical element to it as well and you know she was she would always sort of have a go at singing um, but yeah quite difficult I think because uh, mm -hmm. he, he like I said he does have this quite distinct style and perhaps a lot of his characters in a lot of his films mm -hmm. do share a lot of attributes mm -hmm. um, but I, I never found it sort of monotonous like it, it is still enjoyable to see it obviously you know for, for a, a big chunk of time there yeah. if you're watching a Tim Burton film you wouldn't be surprised to see her in there um, and then obviously that sort of seemed to come to an end when they when they sort of parted ways. And I don't yeah. know really recently how much they've been working alongside each other. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think she sort of did, she did, she was still able to bring kind of a touch, a touch of uniqueness to each of her roles. Right. Uh, her role of Queen Elizabeth, uh, the Queen's mother in the King's Speech. What are your thoughts on that character? Uh, it was interesting to bring something quite delicate. I think mm. that was something that we hadn't quite seen from her before. A lot of her characters have been been very intense. And with this one, it was more, it was just quite understated. It was more graceful. Yeah. Um, and to kind of, she really, I think she really added something to Colin Firth's character in that role as well, and to sort of see them alongside each other. And she just really embodied that sort of, that supportive, that kind of regal, um, that figure figure that he sort of needed at that time in his life and it was very tender I thought and and she did a really wonderful job I think and I think she was really sort of highly acclaimed for that mm -hmm. um, but yeah again interesting just sort of adding another 
a sort of another feather to her cap, if you will, just showing her incredible range, being able to bring someone like that to life, you know, a, a real life figure. Um, yeah, just really, really interesting. And I think she just she just brings another another level to every film she's in. Mm -hmm, great. And Alice, um, like you know, Carter is known for her unconventional and eccentric sense of fashion. I would like you to comment on that. I mean, do you think that could be the reason she nailed her character in Ocean's 8? Quite possibly, yeah. So that is that's something that's kind of always followed her around. I think, or she she did sort of start her own fashion line as well. And um, like I said, this kind of like gothic chic, you know, really kind of enhancing these dark colors, kind of really sort of bringing something else to to this. Yeah quite retro sort of style that she had. Um, but no, it's just very interesting that she is so iconic in that way. And her hair, I feel, has always been quite yeah. iconic. You know, it's never just, mm -hmm. it's never ordinary. I don't think you could ever call Helena Bonham Carter ordinary. She was something that just really stood out. And a lot of the times, you know, because um, people, they, they get typecast or the films and, and directors are looking for a specific look, you know, and it's not always what Helena Bonham Carter is, but she's sort of really filled, filled a bit of a void that I think was there. I don't know if anyone sort of before her, sort of mm -hmm. um, before she came along, if there was anyone quite like her and mm -hmm. there hasn't been anyone quite like her since. And it just seems to be this whole package of this sort of, this very extreme, this very unique fashion sense that just seems to go really well with this sort of persona and this sort of character that she's built around herself. Mm -hmm. Right, and her role in Ocean's 8 was quite a mysterious one. Uh, I would really like you to comment on that. Keeping in mind that being mysterious in her role, she was the only one, probably the only one after Kate Blanchett who had a proper grip on her role. Uh, of course, Ocean's 8 was criticized for so many reasons, but Helena nailed her character. So I would like you to comment on that. So I actually haven't seen Ocean's 8, I'm afraid, so I wouldn't be okay. able to offer a comment on that. Uh -huh. Right, okay, we'll move to our next question. Uh, coming to the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland, your thoughts on her character? Uh, it's incredibly extreme, you know, it's Alice in Wonderland is, mm -hmm. it's almost like the epitome of fantasy. It's mm -hmm. one of the, visually one of the sort of most extreme and wackiest things you could ever see in every iteration of it, you know, even the book, the early films, and then this sort of later iteration of it. Um, and it's, it's just quite manic in kind of the way it looks and the way it feels, and she just you know, she seemed to just slot in so perfectly and kind of really kind of made made the character sort of quite formidable and, you know, domineering yeah. whilst also just being completely chaotic. Um, and it's quite interesting to sort of try and keep a rein on that. And you don't want it to become too farcical where people lose interest and they're like, oh, you know, maybe you can't follow what's going on or, you know, oh, this is too much, you know, I, I'm not really interested in this. But she seems to just kind of nail it sort of yeah. quite well and just kind of strike this really good balance of being sort of, you know, completely absurd but also being quite ominous and a little bit scary. And I think she does that quite well. True. And uh, her ability to jump into any character is truly amazing. I mean, from playing heroes to acting as villains, she had been remarkable. Her character in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was very soft, very tender, uh, a mother who's, you know, a caretaker of the entire family. And then you see her in Alice in Wonderland, complete opposite. So what are your thoughts on this transition or, you know, you can say, in other words, she's jumping from one role to another. How would you like to comment on that? Yes, yeah, certainly. She does have an incredible range and she just always seems to understand the task that is put in front of her. And she's able to dedicate herself completely. Um, I, I do think that she does a, like a bit more research. She likes to know, well, well, what would these people in this situation actually be yeah. feeling? How would they be behaving? For her, it's not just a case of turning up on the day and reading the script. And she doesn't seem too preoccupied with letting any part of herself sort of form, become the character. She she likes to transition completely into a completely new character. And because she does it so well, it makes all of them as believable as the next. So when you do see her in something like Child in the Chocolate Factory, then Alice in Wonderland, then Terminator, then Fight Club, they're all as believable as as the next. And she just she doesn't just kind of leave anything up to chance, I don't think. She's always very considered, very controlled, and just really in charge of, of what it is that she wants to portray and how she wants to bring that character to life. Um, and it's just it's just really wonderful to see. And when you when you kind of look at the list of, of films that she's been in, 
the, the range is just incredible. She, she will do any genre, she will play any character from any time period, and she's just completely unafraid to do it. Yeah. It's almost as if, if she sees a project and she gets invited on board, she just thinks, yeah, if I want to do that, I will do that. And it doesn't really matter if, you know, if maybe someone thinks, oh, no, you don't quite fit into this role, or if you think, oh, no, maybe that's not your style, because that would just be so hard to pinpoint. I don't think you could say that she wouldn't be able to do any genre, because I think she could she could quite possibly do anything. Mm, absolutely. Uh, but yet again, it is quite sad to learn that she's only been nominated for the Oscars, but up until now, she hasn't won uh, any of those Oscars. So don't you think, I mean, she, she always opts for statement roles. She has never gone for anything average or anything less. She's one of those people who don't settle for less. She has always, you know, shown wonders in her acting skills. But at the same time, we only see her for being nominated uh, only twice for the Oscars. So don't you think that she deserves one? It's, I, I wonder if it is something to do with the roles that she plays, because in those sort of bigger films, that she's been in, she is usually the second character. She's yeah. not usually the main, she could be the, the main female, mm -hmm. but she's not always the main character. The film is never really about her or about the character yeah. that she is portraying. So I wonder if that's sort of a bit been maybe a reason for that. But it is interesting that, like you said, she, so she was nominated for two Academy Awards and then she's been nominated for so many other awards. So obviously yeah. people do see the talent there, mm -hmm. but she's just never quite, made it to the top which is interesting i know she's won a couple of baftas um but yeah it's interesting and, and it, it would be interesting to really have a look at why that is but i'm intrigued to see kind of what comes next and if because i i absolutely think that she could carry a, a whole film i think she's absolutely got that ability like she's worked with some, mm -hmm. some of hollywood's greatest actors some of britain's greatest actors of all time mm -hmm. and i feel like she absolutely could carry a film herself and i just absolutely. think it's whether she wants to do that and what opportunities Sort of maybe maybe in front of her um, but it is interesting and i think when you look at some previous winners she is absolutely up to those standards True. Uh, so it's interesting that she has she's never quite quite made it to, to actually scoop the award hmm. alice it was a lovely having you for this tribute thank you very much indeed thank you so much that was alice oliver paying a tribute to helena bonham carter we will be right back after a short break stay tuned Welcome back. In this segment, we will review a Pakistani movie, Binky Memsab. The lives of a simple maid, a beautiful socialite, an ambitious investment banker, and a happy-go-lucky chauffeur become entwined in Dubai. To review the movie, we are joined by Farik Mohar Basu. Mohar, welcome. Thank you, Nalshin. I would like you to first comment on the selection of the story and then how relatable this can be with many people living and working in Mideast, especially from Southeast Asia. Right. Um, you know, uh, Nashin, when I first watched the film, I, I do remember thinking about how tied we are to our own very sense of identity, especially um, the life of an expat. And I think that is what uh, this film kind of takes us through, the journey of this person who finds you know, who goes to a different land in search of a job and a career and gets entangled in a lot of other emotional and other issues, may I say, without giving out too much about the film. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I thought uh, the film is very craftily done in the sense that it kind of takes a deep uh, dive into someone's psyche, what happens to someone who feels displaced and then finding a home and a place um, I think those those issues the film delves into very beautifully. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like you to comment on Pinky's character first. That do you think that there was some sort of development in that character, or you said, I mean, it, it was a static one? Because if you ask me, I think it was still static till the end. I mean, the way she would speak, she was a very quiet girl in from the beginning till the end. But if you saw any development, I would like you to comment on that. So, you know, I honestly did see Pinky come on her own. Like, she she found a voice which she never had. Because when the film starts, um, we see her go back to her ex-husband to say that, hey, I'm going to Dubai. Yeah. And when the film ends, we actually see her uh, saying no to a great, even a very lucrative offer, which some which probably would have given her some sort of emotional anchoring in life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think she finds a voice through the film. 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's very important to find that, and I think through the story, she she kind of understands what she doesn't want to say yes to. Mm-hmm. Right. And Meher is yet another important character in Pinky's life. How would you define her character? She's a very torn person, you know. Mm-hmm. She's she's torn between who she like. She has an idea of who she is. Mm-hmm. She's not at peace with herself. She has very troubled relationships, be it with her husband, be it with her father. And you know, slowly through the film, she kind of comes around and fixes each of those equations. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, I love the parts which are which are shot between her and her father. They kind of there's a beautiful line where he where he talks about how you know, uh, because she's a writer, he says that you know you people have made stars out of Manto and a lot of other guys, but have you read the to kind of comment on the fact that they are not as good? Mm-hmm. You know, and that I thought was very poignant. He was speaking to the writer within her, saying that find your own voice, find your own identity, what you want to feel passionately about, what you want to write about. So that was her father's way of telling her that hey, you can do better. Mm-hmm. So I think that you know, by the time she through the film she fixes her equations, she also finds her own space in that mm-hmm. sense. Right. And now coming to Santo character that has actually shown as the real life support we all need in our lives. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was very surprised to see Sunny Induja. Sunny Induja has now become a big star because of Family Man. Yes. Uh, but I was very surprised to see him, uh, you know, in that film. Because, like I told you, I revisited the film again, and then I realized that see, the guy always had caliber, and he did some great work even in the yes, past. Yes. The character of Santosh is very. Um, It's very interesting. He's also someone who, quite early on, he says that you know, I've, I've, my wife's run away, and mm-hmm. I just have a son, and I have a father. Mm-hmm. And he's also someone who's looking for companionship. Yes. You know, like there's a there's a line in the film that says that uh, loneliness is a very dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. Matlab, I don't remember the exact line, but it says that uh, you know, it can hide you from something mm-hmm. to that effect. Yes, I think that what is Santosh's crux. I think I think loneliness was killing him. And I'm glad he goes back to his family eventually because he needs a home. Mm-hmm. He, he's he's looking for something that I don't don't think anyone in Dubai was able to offer him. He's looking yes. for a space in that sense. Uh-huh. And uh, Mohar, there's a beautiful transition in the entire movie with every character. I mean, each and every character was shown very confused and unhappy with what they're doing, the kind of lives they're living. But at the end, everyone finds peace and the real meaning of their own life. So this sort of transition actually, you know, it it makes the movie stand out. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, the movie stands out because of a lot of reasons. Um, mm-hmm. Like you rightly said, it's about transitions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think another reason why the movie stands out is also because we are we are identifying with the transitions of these characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, be it Hassan, be it Meher, be it Pinky. Mm-hmm. I think we relate to or Santosh for that matter. We relate to each of them at some at one level or the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, their journeys and what they are kind of put through. Like for example, uh, in in say Hassan's case, yeah. he's so busy that he's not focusing on his interpersonal relationship, mm-hmm. on his on the most important relationship in his life, which is his marriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, in case of uh, Meher, she's so unhappy with herself mm-hmm. that she can't look beyond the fact that you know that she's damaging the other, other good things mm-hmm. in her life because she's so unhappy with who she is. She's not found who she is. Yes. Pinky, on the other hand, is easy to. Maybe you know she's a little gullible. She's easy yes. to please. So she needs to get over that so that people don't keep taking advantage of her. People around her who she invests so deeply in. Right. So I think each of these characters have very different sort of takeaways, and you learn from each of them, and they're so relatable and raw in that sense. True. So I think that's what stands out about the film. Right, right. Mohar, there's one thing that I would like you to comment on: the name. Does it complement the movie? Because when you read the name Pinky Mainsab, one can easily think that okay, it's just about Pinky. We're at at some point. Yeah. Does it feel like a diverting story towards other characters like Meher, her father, and even Aisha? I mean, they went into yeah. very fine details of every character that is coming in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you know they could have gone with a different name to give it a more diverse. Yeah. Um, Outlook or a sense in that way, mm-hmm. but I just feel that Pinky is the one who, who probably is the director's muse and is the director's tool of telling the story. Yeah. I think that's what Shahzad was trying to do. Uh, she, she uses Pinky as a tool to kind of 
explore each of these lives. So in that sense, I understand why she would have gone with the title. But uh, yeah, I know. You know, when I when I started watching the film, uh, I thought it's a different movie. I thought it, it's about her journey alone. But I guess it. The, you know, it was that slice of life drama that goes into each of its characters and very in depth that. Right, and Mahar, besides too many subjects have been addressed in just one movie, do you think overall it was an effective one? Yeah, you know, honestly, I do think Pim Pinky Ming Ming Sub is a very effective uh, film. It doesn't delve too much into a lot of things, like it could have given a little more screen space and screen time mm -hmm. to uh, say Hassan's equation with uh, yeah. Pinky and how that changes after, after, that, after that whole swimming pool night. I think they don't ever go into detail of her psyche and how she kind of gets over that very scarring incident of her life. It was an embarrassment for her and I don't think she deserved it on any level. I think the film kind of emits out, um, a, 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 like, you know, it omits basically a lot of these details, yeah. but it ju does justice to the larger narrative in that sense because I think it, it tells what it sort of tells. Right. And talking about the music movie, how would you rate it? I think the music was very poignant. Some of the songs are very, uh, they they have a lingering effect on you. Mm -hmm. So the music kind of complemented the flavor of the film. The film also has a very cosmopolitan fl flavor. Mm -hmm. It's it's earthy, but it, it's also very, uh, it's very urban in that sense. So I think the music also kind of does justice to mm -hmm. how the how the film pans out. So the music is very complimentary. That's right, yes. right. And last but not the least, three reasons why would you recommend this movie to someone who hasn't watched it yet? Uh, great storytelling. I think uh, to be able to tell a very heartfelt story is very important. It uh, it uh, does that very effectively. Um, I think the music uh, is also one of the reasons why, why someone should watch the film because the music is, uh, you know how music elevates a narrative? I think this, this film is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. And I think the film is also a great example of good writing, especially uh, balanced gender gender neutral writing in that sense mm. you know both the male and the female characters have been shown from a very empathetic gaze right. so i i do laud the writer and the director for that right mohar it was a beautiful review thank you very much indeed for joining us thank you so much Nashreen. that was mohar basu reviewing pinky mame sab and that is it from today's episode we hope you liked it don't forget to share your feedback on the social media link mentioned down below We'll see you next time. Until then, take care and goodbye.